What's up, Cole? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, now I can. Yes. Uh, so I'm probably gonna, I don't know why my camera's not, oh, actually, that's um, fine. I'm gonna wait just a few more minutes. You're, you're in a uh, software. Right? Yeah. yeah. What uh what phase are you in? I'm actually doing the pre-work right now. Oh no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I start in June. Word. Well, this is uh I'm in data science and this is my gonna be my presentation for my phase two project. Um so not uh not quite in your like field of study or whatever, but I'm sure it'll still be. Hopefully you can like ask some like hard questions for me. Well, I really don't know much about data science, but uh, I'll try. <laughs> sure. Well, so that's like, that's why I wanted to do this because the, with the project presentation, like the whole like scenario is that you're like a stakeholder and you're like a non-technical person, um, like that doesn't like, you know, code or anything. So I'm supposed to be able to like communicate this to somebody that like doesn't like actually know what like about this sort of thing. Um, so that's why I wanted to like practice that like for real, you know what I mean? Cause like your instructor that you present to like they like actually do like know like what you're talking about. So yeah, I don't know, it seemed like good practice. This is my buddy Cole uh, too. I know him from like university school. Hey Cole. Uh, he's Hello. in like finance and stuff. So the, the whole, the presentation is gonna be about real estate, like the real estate market in Washington. So, oh, I'm really into real estate. Yeah. Okay. Well, this will be like yeah. this will be perfect then. Um, yeah. I want to, I'm trying to like stall just a couple more minutes in case anybody else joins it. Cause I kind of like put the word out, but uh, it might just be the two of us. I don't know. So what made you want to, um, oh yeah, there we go. Hey, Austin. Um, what made you want to do flat iron? Like what were you doing like before and like, what made you be like, oh, I got to like learn code. Well, I've always um, been interested in coding. I took, you know, Visual Basic in high school and JavaScript in college and um, built websites and stuff as a teenager and but never pursued it as a career. Um, I, I'm a very art, artistic. Um, I, was, I was a musician for a long time and um, I guess I still am, but professionally and, uh, and a writer. Um, and just really creative. And I it just, I've, I've always been afraid to go into mathy computer sciencey things because yeah. I just thought that's not my brain, but I, it's just a lie I've been telling myself. I, I can have yeah. any brain I want. So um, I'm just, I decided I was so sick of telling myself, no, just give it like, give it a shot, see what happens. So um, I started doing um, Code Academy and um, some other websites and free coding camp, I guess. And uh, yeah, free coding camp. Um, yeah, and I was really getting into it. And I said, well, why don't I try something that's, you know, more legitimate and maybe going to give me better, better education. So I just, you know, like a month ago or so decided yeah. to apply. For flat but I think like another, like one of the things that you really get from a boot camp that you don't necessarily get on like or whatever is like, like this sort of thing where you meet like other people like entering the industry like kind of at the same time you are. Um, and like the instructors you make connections with and all that, like you don't get to know when you're like, you know, just like kind of typing away on like free yeah, camps or whatever. But uh, free code camps are really cool to me because my degree is in Spanish and they have uh, most of their curriculum available in like, multiple different languages. Uh, so, like sometimes I'll go in there and I'll study like HTML like in Spanish just to keep up my Spanish. Uh, so really like, I really like free code camps. Um, well, let's five so i guess we'll go ahead and start and anybody else joins in and then it's awesome um, i have to share this and hey kurt would you mind muting your mic. oh i'm so sorry i thought i had it muted i'm sorry okay. thank you okay 
All right. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Seth Abney, and this is my, uh, let me get my timer started, my presentation for uh, my market penetration analysis in King County, Washington for Flip House LLC, which is the figurative uh, company that I'm doing this analysis for. You guys are in this situation, stakeholders, uh, non-technical stakeholders. So at the end of this, will be like a Q&A and you'll get to ask me questions about uh, the presentation, anything that uh, I didn't cover that you want to know about. Um, but try to ask questions like as if you're a stakeholder and I'm kind of giving you guidance on like what to do with your business. So anyway, what I did was I built a multiple regression model to predict housing prices based on a set of other pieces of information about a house, such as its square footage and that sort of thing. Uh, to build this model, uh, tonight what I'm gonna talk to you about first is sort of the, some of the business issues that I considered that Flip House LLC uniquely faces uh, in terms of entering this, like a new market. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the data that I actually used to build the model. Uh, how I manipulated that data to build like the model itself. And then at the end, we'll get to like the really important stuff. And we'll talk about what my interpretation of the model is and uh, what kind of real action we can take based off of the information from the model. And then we'll have a little Q&A there at the end. So what are some of the business issues considered? Well, we're penetrating a new market. So we need to understand both the opportunity cost of not investing in potential real estate opportunity or piece of real estate that's on the market. We also need to understand, of course, what are the potential returns on it? If it's within an acceptable range of our opportunity costs, uh, is there enough ROI to make it worth our time? And that sort of thing. As a house flipping company, of course, we ex uh, work or operate on both sides of the transaction. Sometimes we're buying houses and sometimes we're selling houses. So we, the three broad questions that I tried to answer with this model is when, where, and what to buy and or sell. So let's talk a little bit about the data that was actually used. Uh, we're entering a new market, right? So we don't have any historical data on how our business operates and its successes or failures in this market. So I used some data that was publicly available from King County, Washington themselves. Uh, by the time the mall development was all said and done, where I ended up using about 93% of the original data available. Uh, it's also important to note that the data only covers a time span of about one year from May to May. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. A little bit about the actual process of model development. Like I said, we ended up only using about 93% of the data. Um, that's because some of the stuff was thrown out as outlier data points and things, other things of that nature. Uh, we had to encode some of the data. So to plug in the data into this uh, statistical model that, that I used, everything has to be a number. So if we have a column where there's like, uh, good, great, and excellent, uh, like words, then we swap those out for like, say, one, two, and three. And so that way we're able to keep sort of the same information, but still represent it as a number so that we can use it in the uh, algorithm used to build the model. After we uh, sort of get done with manipulating the data, we move into rigorous feature selection where we essentially build a model and look at how it performs using some model diagnostics. And we pick and choose which columns, if you imagine like an Excel spreadsheet and a table, we pick and choose which columns to include or exclude depending on how they affect uh, the performance and the reliability of the model. So uh, once we get a model that we're pretty happy with or just periodically throughout the process, we'll also go through model validation, which is basically where we'll take all the data and we'll split it into like say 10 different samples We'll train a model with nine of those samples, and then we'll test the output of those nine samples against the output of the one uh, sample left over. And so, and we do that in multiple sort of like groupings, and that helps us sort of ensure that the model not only represents what's going on in the data that uh, was plugged into the model, but it represents what's kind of really going on in the real world where the data came from. So let's get into the model itself. So I keep talking about this model thing, right? And that's basically what you see here in front of you with the exception of a few other metrics. Um, but this is basically what I'm talking about. And I don't want you to worry too much about all these numbers over here on the right. That's a lot to look at. Really just kind of zero in on these bolded words right here in the center of the screen. So you can imagine if all our data is in a table in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, these bolded words are the labels for each one of the columns, right? Uh, so like I said, when I was building this model, I was trying to answer where, what, and when. So I grouped all of these features together, these bolded words, that's what we call our features. Uh, 
in a way that we can kind of inform ourselves as to what some real world questions that the model can answer. So I made this visualization here. And what I basically want you to get out of this is just a sense of how much each one of these questions sort of contributes to the model's prediction of the price. Uh, or in other words, if you're considering buying or selling a home, like to what degree each one of these things uh, might affect the potential price of that transaction, right? So obviously how far north the house is, the latitude specifically is the feature from the data, uh, that mattered a lot, uh, nearly half as much as everything else combined, of course. And as you can see, the fact that it's on a waterfront at all matters quite a bit, and not to mention which waterfront it's on. Um, I do want to point out, though, that which waterfront matters in the sense that some of them make the drive the price up and some of them drive the price down. Um, how much repair the home needs and so on. Uh, one more thing I want to point out here with this visualization is you can see that wind is almost not visible. Uh, so the model as it exists now is probably, I don't feel comfortable making any statements that I can empirically support with the model in terms of when to buy or sell. So unfortunately, at this point with the model we have now, we can't predict really anything about when to buy or sell a house, but we do have some good information about uh, where and what at least. So in conclusion, what are my personal suggestions about uh, entering the, this new market? You want something north or downtown, at least. Um, best case scenario, you get a waterfront property on Lake Union. Uh, if you can't do that, try and get something at least downtown uh, or north of it and autumn waterfront if you can. Of course, you want a nice view. Everybody likes a nice view. And naturally, if you're on a waterfront, you would like to have a view of the waterfront that you're on so you can show your guests and, and that sort of thing. Uh, interesting thing, you probably want, as a house flipping company, if you're buying a house with the intention of fixing it and selling it later, you want to find something uh, that's in need of actual repair. And I don't mean like just updated, like you're going to replace the curtains and put some new appliances in. You want something that's in need of like actual repair, because those are probably the only properties that you're going to find in a neighborhood that's nice enough that you would want to sell in it, but that you're going to be able to buy it for a cheap enough price that you can make a good enough profit off of it. Um, also, the model recommends adding bathrooms, to, to put it simply. Um, there's a correlation between bathrooms and the price of a home, of course, the more bathrooms, uh, the larger the home probably is. Uh, and so uh, that drives the price up. But as somebody who's lived on a lake for a significant portion of my life as a lake person, if you will, uh, in terms of bathrooms, what would be more interesting to me in terms of buying a home is like a two bedroom with an outdoor shower stall between the waterfront access and the home itself than uh, something without that and having like three, bed, uh, three bathrooms in the house. Uh, reason being, anybody that's ever lived on a lake knows that you need some sort of like wash station, at least for your feet, uh, anytime you go from the lake to indoors. You don't want to bring all that lake stuff inside. So the model recommends adding bathrooms. I personally recommend adding an outdoor shower stall or wash station like that. Um, uh, because uh, as the rest of the model suggests, you want something that's on a waterfront anyway. So that is it for my presentation. If you want any more information or you wanna read the detailed report on the analysis, you can find all that at the GitHub repository, which I can make available to you. And if you want to contact me in the future with any questions, you can uh, contact me here at this Gmail. And with that, I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, did you, um, did you, do you have any data on what the most, um, the highest return on investment is? Uh, what am I trying to say? Which properties have the highest return on investment? Would it be buildings with significant repair on a certain lake, a certain waterfront or, um, properties that are most um, need the least amount of repairs, but they're, you know, far north. Is there some combination of factors that, that um, display a highest return on investment? Yeah, um, so I mean, I would get something that's in need of repair that's on a waterfront, uh, especially like on Lake Union specifically. Uh, so that's the thing, you can find a lot of houses that like you can, that are in need of repair, right? Uh, the hard part's gonna be finding a house that's in need of repair that, uh, is in a neighborhood where you're going to be able to sell it for anything that's worth buying it for in the first place. Were there any other data sets that you analyzed that aren't included in your um, 
in this presentation, such as yeah. maybe lot size or other attributes? Um, well, sorry, re repeat your question. Are there other data points that you um, analyzed in your research that um, that also would have a, a significant impact on return on investment? For instance, properties with a larger lot size or smaller lot size, or um, you know, I'm thinking of the ability to build an in-law apartment. Um, you know, these these kinds of factors that you maybe analyzed and there wasn't enough data, or maybe there was some data but not strong enough to draw a conclusion. So maybe you didn't report on it. Right. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, there, there was a feature for like just the square footage of the house. There was a, we had a feature for square footage of just everything above the basement. We had a feature for square footage of the lot. We had a lot of like square footage information like that, but the only one that like sort of survived the filter, if you will, is this square foot living 15 feature right here. And what that is, is the average square footage of living space for the 15 nearest houses. Um, so but that's the only feature that we have that points towards like square footage of the house specifically you can infer if like that like with bathrooms like the more bathrooms there are obviously there's gonna be more fair square footage um but so these are these coefficient column this first column you see to the right right here that's like the percentage that the price of the house increases for every unit increase in whatever the corresponding like feature is right um so I didn't include square foot living in this visualization right here, because as you can see, it's like two, what is that, uh, millionths uh, of a percent. Um, so there's not like, you know, like maybe like from that, we can infer that the price increases, you know, by a thousandth of a penny or something for every like extra square foot, but that's not some, that's not really a big enough impact to drive decision-making. Uh, so I didn't really include it in like my final, recommendations here like right at the end um, but we do have data on it and i maybe could go back and build a model if i just immediately if i just use like square footage data and just started with that um then i can maybe build something uh that specifically point like predicts like what square footage you want um i could build something like that potentially but the way i built this i just started with like all the data i had available and i kind of plugged it into a filter and i saw like what was left on the other side of the filter um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Cool. Um, I also like looked at uh, bringing in a completely other data set that I got from uh, data.world. And if you look in the Jupyter notebook, you can see the code where like I imported the data and like manipulated it and tried to join it and everything. Um, and so what I did was I got like the income tax revenue and the average uh, income per capita or per household uh, for each zip code like in the data set. And I tried to look at if that was, um, you know, I figured like that would be a strong predictor, right? Uh, what's basically like, what's the like tax bracket of your zip code? That's what I like and kind of encoded it as. And that didn't even like uh, survive the filter, but I tried, so I tried bringing in like other data sets like that weren't even part of this like original data set provided by Flatiron, um, but it didn't survive the filter unsurprisingly. Austin, Cole, y'all got any questions? I don't have any questions. It's I followed pretty much all of that. Okay. Cole, what about you? What makes a property on a waterfront possibly be less valuable rather than you said if a property is on a waterfront, it could mean mm -hmm. that it's more valuable or less valuable. What is a case scenario where a property would be less valuable on a waterfront? Lake Washington. So you'll see right here, uh, like kind of like a quarter from the bottom, there's this feature called waterfront. Uh, and that predicts about like 0.35% of, of the price. Um, so that's just if it's on a waterfront or not. Like if a property is on a waterfront, then the price is automatically going to be like this much more. Uh, let me get my thing. Um, so if a property is on a waterfront at all, it's automatically going to be this much more than an equivalent house that's not on a waterfront, right? That's what that means. Versus uh, like Lake Washington, for example, for the 
any house that's on Lake Washington, it's going to be this much less uh, or this much percentage less than it would be an equivalent house that's not on Lake Washington. You're kind of blinking your eyes. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question. That makes sense. So if it's on a waterfront at all, like that's a plus. Um, so even Lake Washington probably. Um, but you could think of it like in within the set of waterfronts, Lake Washington is maybe like the last waterfront that you would want to be at if assuming that you're on a waterfront. So unless you guys got any other questions, uh, that's pretty much it. Well, that was a great presentation. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. Was that, um, like, I'm worried that I, like, I tend to, like, ramble, I feel like. And does that, like, all the mathy and, like, weird, like, technical stuff, does it, you know, make sense? To like somebody that doesn't use stats all day, you know what I mean? As someone who doesn't use stats all day, I will say that um, I was unsure if um, on that chart, if that was a per percentage uh, point. So when you're saying like on Lake Washington minus two, it, is that out of percent or is that a tenth of a percent or what is the scale of that? That's that's percentage. So it's all okay. like, you know, a third of the count, like that sort of okay. thing. Okay. Okay. And that's because the target variable price was log transformed. Uh, if it wasn't log transformed, then it would have been like for every unit increase in the feature, it's a unit increase in the target. So it'd be like by, by the dollar instead of like 34 cents instead of 34 0.34% of the price. So when you're talking about, you know, homes that are worth like two or $3 million, like 0.34% of the price, like might actually like be like something worth negotiating over. You know what I mean? Cool. Um, oh, I probably should have said this at the start, but I did record this like for my purposes because like I blog and YouTube and stuff. So I hope you guys don't mind me being on the internet somewhere on a Zoom call YouTube video. Cool.